All right, everybody. Good evening. It's Tuesday night. It's 730 Central, and I have one of my former teammates and one of the more athletically gifted uh, teammates I ever had. My guest out of Murfreesboro, number 40, Gerald Collins, class of 94. How you doing, bud? I'm doing great. Doing great. Glad right. to be here. I, and I'm glad for you to be on here as well. Guys, back in the day, this man could do anything an athlete could do. He could dunk a ball during an exhibition during halftime. We'll get into that in a minute. He could go all 53 yards sideline to sideline with any of the fastest guys in the SEC. I'm telling you, you got to go find some film on this dude because he was the man. And frankly, when we signed him, I was a bit surprised because as athletically gifted as Gerald was back in the day and the talent that he brought to campus, I would have been, I would have sworn a big 12, one of the bigger uh, state schools would have scooped him up, but we were fortunate to have Gerald come and be a Commodore with us. And we're going to get into all that good stuff. But before we do, Gerald, tell folks what you do in Murfreesboro and about your beautiful family. Catch us up to the current version of Gerald Collins. Well, as you said, uh, we, we reside here in Murfreesboro. We've been here about five years. Uh, my wife, Amanda, and I've got two boys. I've got a 14, almost 15-year-old Brandon. He's a, he's a football player. He's a, he plays over at Innsworth High School. Um, Wait, does he play for Rock? Play for Coach Rock Batten, yep. Nice, nice. He just finished his freshman, freshman season. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got Benny. He's my seven-year-old. He's uh, he'll be eight here on January first. Mm -hmm. He is actually at basketball practice right now, so he's uh, he's picking up that sport. He played a little football as well, but uh, but yeah, we live out here. I work for um, Nissan and down in Smyrna, the mm -hmm. Nissan plant, uh, number one car manufacturer in North America. Um, by volume and been there for about 10 or 11 years now. Mm -hmm. And um, I work, I work with the compliance team. Uh, we're, a, we're a part of uh, product quality assurance. Um, we perform the weld audits throughout the plant, throughout the body shop on all the, the different robots and the different work areas, making sure everybody is adhering to the global standard that we operate under. Um, so not necessarily the most exciting work, but <laughs> it's, um, I enjoy, I enjoy it. Well, it sounds like you're still a leader on the team. And I suspect when you have stuff to say to your team members, they're going to listen to you in that plant. I just have a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jared, we got some folks Woo, Linda let coach Shep off early tonight. We got Gary Shepard says to tell you hello. Gary Shepard. Hello, coach. I remember coach well. OJ Fleming. OJ Fleming says that the bridge of his nose remembers you well. <laughs> OJ Fleming. That's my guy. How the pride doing? of Pittsburgh. Sam Chalmers in the Sam house. Sam Chalmers. That's my main man. Sam came in the same year I came in and, you know, we, we had a lot of fun times. That's one of my, my favorite guys, favorite teammates of all time. And a great player, great person. I miss him. Well, I hope you guys get to connect. We also got, uh, uh, as always, Dwayne Jones is with us. Thank you, Dwayne. Oh, from the West Coast, even though he's an LA Dodgers fan, we'll still let him in the house. Sweet Lou Woolridge says to tell you hello. Lou Woolridge, that's right. That's that's my guy, Lou. Great guy, great football player, great leader. I mean, just one of the one of the greatest teammates I ever had as well. And coming out of the St. Pete, Tampa area, one of your teammates on the defensive side of the field, Gary Rogers, also says to tell you hello. He says, "What's up, business?" <laughs> yeah, that name, uh, that name, business. That was a name within within a few days of getting on campus. You know, a lot of guys saw they saw how kind of serious I was, or at least I was acting at that time, and they kind of said, "He's about business. He means business." So that, you, that, that name stuck around with a few guys anyway. You, you did. You gave off that vibe from the minute I, I laid eyes on you being on the other side 
of the the field uh, you are all all business how is it that you ended up in nashville tell us a little bit about your recruiting well history. i wasn't i mean i was i wasn't a like a one of these top top recruit guys i was i was a very good athlete as you said but uh as a football player i was really just starting to come into my own my senior year in St. Louis. I had I had actually played quarterback my sophomore and junior season for the majority of my junior season and didn't get a chance to play much defense until my senior year. And so I switched positions my halfway through my junior year, started playing tight end, played tight end and, and actually was a strong safety on defense. And um started to come into my own and started getting some recruitment. And I ended up, um, you know, being recruited by a lot of schools in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And I had a list of, uh, it was Vanderbilt and Oklahoma State, Louisville, um, University of Missouri was in there for a little while, but I really wasn't interested in going there. Um, so I was getting, getting some interest. And I was, I'll be honest with you, I was headed towards Oklahoma State. That's where I was going. And um, you know, this was right after Barry Sanders had the record-breaking season, Heisman season, and went on a visit there and just, man, was blown away by everything and just loved it. And, but there was this looming probation that they were about to go into because yeah, of that. <laughs> yeah, there was a bunch of schools in that conference. Well, I guess it would have been the Big Eight at the time. They they had gotten in trouble for recruiting this one particular player and got a bunch of schools in trouble. But anyway, so my dad, my dad, you know, he kind of could see things a little differently than I could at that age. You know, I was all for the for the kind of the things that an eighteen year old would would be thinking about. Yeah. And my dad was like, look, this team is getting ready to go on probation mm -hmm. and um, they're not going to be able to play on TV for several years. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of things, not going to be able to go to a bowl game, just a lot of things going on that wasn't really good. And he, and we looked at Vanderbilt and he was like, look, from an academic standpoint, and then from the standpoint of playing in the SEC and an opportunity to maybe get on the field quickly, Mm -hmm. You know, this is a school and I, you know, he, he left it up to me, but my dad had a lot of influence over me and I took his, his opinion very seriously. And, yeah. um, and I'm, I'm, I ended up going with Vanderbilt. I'm, I'm glad I did. I mean, I, I had a, I had a great time when I came down to Vanderbilt and there wasn't a whole lot that could be, could sway me the other way. We had actually had a guy from my conference, mm -hmm. Will uh, William Brown, who had come to Vanderbilt the year before. Oh yeah. oh yeah. So he hosted me when I came down on on the recruiting visit, and you know he kind of reinforced a lot of the things. Another another guy who was influential was uh, Carlos Thomas. When when uh, when I came on my visit, my I remember how impressed my dad was with this guy. I mean, he was just you know Carlos was a. You know, he, 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 he was selling the program at that time. And, uh, you know, it was, I remember my dad always remembered him and he remembered him from that visit. About yeah. how, how smart he was and just how, you know, this guy could just, you know, kind of take the conversation in a lot of different directions and speak intelligently and all that and was a good football player. Well, those, and those guys were in, in a great recruiting class the year or so before you. And yeah. Been a lot documented about those guys, and yeah. I, hope, I hope to get both of them on the show. And in fact, William's son played for Coach Mason uh, more, most recently. Yeah, but Harold, we got some other folks who are rolling in. How about Royce Love? Royce Chef, Love, say hello. We used to bang heads quite a bit, man. I still, I still can feel some of the, the, the those ISO blocks coming from Royce Love. <laughs> Greg Simmons name. has joined us. And oh, that's Sam Chalmers says he also he calls you business and he says came from going to Fountain Square as a freshman. Good memories. 
Yeah, I remember Fountain Square. Yeah. Now I'll tell you this, Joe. Anything you want to share here, it's just between us. And the right. statute of limitations is long expired on anything that you could want to share. So feel free to expand yeah. on any of those memories. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, just in the last few weeks, just thinking, thinking back on some of the things, man, I tell you what, it was, it was a great time. And I tell any any young person that I talk to that has an opportunity to go off to school and to be you know, in, involved in sports, I tell them if you get an opportunity to do it, to live on campus, do it because it's a great time. It's a great, just, I've never experienced anything like it before or since. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I, I recommend it for anybody who gets the opportunity to go off to school and kind of, I mean, it, it, it puts you in a situation where you, where you get to find out who you are, you get to grow as a man or, or a young lady, whatever it is. And, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it. And uh, you're about to, to change roles because in a couple of years, you're going to be doing for your son, what your dad did for you. You're now going to be the advisor and hopefully yeah. he'll have an opportunity should he want to play on the next level. But one of the great things to me is he also has as a head coach, Rock Batten, who's been there as well. And boy, what, what two awesome role models. And I'm sure there are others, men and women in his life who serve in that. And, and we're gonna get to that in, in a few minutes, Gerald, but I don't wanna skip ahead because I wanna take you back to being a freshman and what you remember about the first time lining up against your teammates you know, in, you're finally, you're now in the college level. You go from being a big fish in a little pond to now a smaller fish in a much bigger pond where everybody, most everybody has good, good speed, good hands, can think real strong. But now you're having to, to learn what the next level is about. And from my observation, it didn't take you long at all. And I mean well, this with the utmost compliments because what you what I what we would see of you may not have been it may have been a little bit slower to mentally adjust to assignments and learning technology excuse me terminology but the athleticism was always there so share yeah. a little bit about that transition well I, I I'll tell you what I was new to I had never played linebacker number one had never played it um, so I was stepping into a new position. And I remember I had uh, coach uh, Rick Christoffel as my position coach, man. And you know who, where he's coaching now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and I tell you what, he was great. He was great mm -hmm. from the standpoint of understanding that, all right, this guy's got some athletic ability, but he's new to the position. And man, he, he was really in tune with making sure I understand. I understood the importance of, all the little steps and the little different things you got to do to make reads mm -hmm. and just to understand the mental part of playing the position. And man, he was, he was, and, and he could see it in me sometimes when I would get down and he would always have something to say to kind of pick me up. And I, I, I really always appreciated him and never forgot that. And, you know, I wish I could have had him longer, but yeah, it was, it was, um, you know, I, I, when I stepped on the field, you know, kind of the first few practices, you know, you kind of a little bit unsure of kind of where you stand. But then once we kind of started hitting a little bit, I, I was like, okay, I, I, I can, I can hang. Mm -hmm. And, but, but I was just, you know, my head was swimming. And so it was just a matter of getting, you know, getting, getting that part of it together. Now we had a guy by the name of Demond Winston, who was the starting middle linebacker. Yeah. Demond was my recruiting class. One of mine. Yeah, I remember Coach Christopher telling me, Gerald, you watch this guy. You watch everything he does. When we're out on this practice field, you watch what he does and you make sure you, you're in tune with, because that's the position that you're going to be playing. So I, so I use him definitely as a, as a role model. You know, I would watch him and just try to understand what he was doing and see if I can apply it and pick up things and add to my game. Um, yeah, couldn't have, couldn't have had a better guy out front as a starting linebacker to kind of to kind of watch and emulate. Joe, when did when did you learn you were redshirting your freshman year and how did you take it? Well, I actually um, 
So I played in 89. I played special teams, and I can't remember. It was maybe the first two or three games, maybe even more than that, maybe maybe the first four or five games. I was playing special teams, and as far as I knew, I was going to, you know, not redshirt, mm -hmm. but then I ended up getting my uh, a sprained knee in practice. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a kind of a, you know, somebody come down with a helmet on my knee mm -hmm. and sprained my knee pretty bad. They actually thought that I was going to have a, have it blown out. It felt like it was, I mean, it was, I had never felt anything like that before. I had never had a knee problem in my life. And anyway, they thought it was going to be really bad, but turned out it wasn't, but it was bad enough to where they made the decision. And I guess I, at that time, and I don't know what it is now, but there was like a certain amount of games. If you hadn't reached that number, yeah. you could still red shirt. And so, you know, I was, I was disappointed because I was, you know, looking forward to, you know, continuing to play in games and, you know, traveling with the team and all that. But, you know, I, I accepted it. I was, I was, it was necessary. Coach Christopher talked to me about it and, and you know, kind of got me to where I could understand and, and accept what it was. And ultimately, but your sophomore year, your second and third years, you got playing time. But, yeah. but along the way, I know you had some other issues. You had a medical red shirt in there, but I don't, I don't necessarily want to run through each of the years, but I want you to share, because you, you and Terrell Davis have a bond that goes back that it's more memorable for you, the former Georgia running back, than it is for him. But along the way, you had some memorable games and some memorable plays. And I kind of, I want to run through a little bit of that because some of those wins when you were playing for Coach DiNardo, I know the 89 and 90 with Coach Brown, then yeah. DiNardo comes in in 91 for the rest of your time there. And it was a whole different um, mindset, a whole different staff, a whole different philosophies. And I know that's a big transition for, for many people, but you also had how many different position coaches? Because once Christopher left, then yeah, I had I had uh, Doug everything. Matthews mm -hmm. after Christopher. I had Doug Matthews. He was in there for one year, mm -hmm. so he was my position coach for that one year of ninety. And then um, after uh, ninety ninety one, um, I want to say it went right into Coach Coach Reese, um, uh, Bull Reese. But yeah, we 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 went through that transition with Donardo. It, it was a different. It was just a totally different mentality that he brought. Mm -hmm. And when he came in, he was hardcore and he was pushing us pretty hard. And I, I'm the type of person, I never shied from hard work or any of that. And so I just, if I didn't know anything else, I knew how to go to work. And mm -hmm. so I just worked as hard as I could and tried to listen, tried to be coachable and all those things. And you know, he was he was trying to find out who really wanted to be there for the right reasons. And, you know, it was it was a. It was a good situation. It was it was it was eye opening, but I thought it was it was what we needed. It was a, you know, a little bit, a little bit harder, I guess, day to day grind. And I think we kind of needed that. We needed to grow up a little bit. Well, it's the rare <laughs> it's the rare ball player who survives bell buckle and has something positive to say. So my question to you, do you have anything positive from a memory standpoint of your bell buckle experiences? Well, I remember it just being, <laughs> I mean, it was a grind. It was hard. Now, the guys that I played with definitely would remember that I was a guy that when we had that break in between practices, I went to sleep. And there was guys that would stay up playing cards and doing all this stuff. But, man, I would get my nap in mm -hmm. and try to have, have that energy for the next practice. And, I mean, it was hard, but I, I never looked at it as anything that was like – I didn't look at it as, like, punishment. Mm -hmm. I, I looked at it as, hey, this is the price we have to pay if we want to have this success that mm -hmm. everybody says we want to have. And so I was all for it. And – you know, it kind of shows you sometimes what people are made of 
when they're put in those tough situations because yeah. you know there was people who would who would tap out you know mm -hmm. i hate to and i'm not gonna go there and say name but there was people who would tap out man and that and that to me always said something about that guy and maybe maybe that's not the guy that needs to be out there on saturday and, and you know it was tough but but you know it was necessary and maybe that was part of the purpose of bell buckle experience because and, and my classes never went we were i was just with coach brown but yeah. gerald was it as much mental as it was physical on yeah the, i think it was i think it was mental? more i think it was more mental i mean it was it was uh because it was like you know, you never knew when it was going to end. So you're in the middle of this, mm -hmm. this grind, and there was no knowing when it was going to end. It was just go as hard as you can go and trust that this, that you're going to come out on the other side of it. So yeah, it took, it took a mentally tough person. I mean, there was times where I could see why somebody would want it, would want to be out of it. Mm -hmm. But I had this thing in me that I was, you know, I was, I was always like, I had this mentality of nobody's going to break me. You know, mm -hmm. that was my, nobody is going to break me and make me just because I'm tired, pull myself out or I just, I just wouldn't do it. And so it, it, it yeah, it, it made me find out some things about myself, I guess. And, you know, and those kind of things stick with you, you know, you know what you're capable of when you go through stuff like that. Did you surprise yourself at what you were able to uh, conquer, if you will? Yeah, yeah. You know, at times I did. I can remember, I can remember, and this was more winter conditioning. And we, we went through winter conditioning that was hard. I mean, just crazy hard. And I remember one time, I guess Coach Reese saw the look on my face and I was kind of maybe, maybe doubting myself a little bit in that moment. And I remember Coach Reese saying, he said, Gerald, you're not going to die you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Mm -hmm. And I just got this surge of just, all right, I'm with you coach. And, but yeah, it was, it, it, it was tough, man, but you know, it was not something that you couldn't do. You know, you found out you could do it. One, one of, to me, one of the beautiful things about playing team sports, whether it's high school, college or whatever level is the, those lessons that you learn, not only about yourself, but about teammates, about goals, goal setting, uh, the wins and the losses. You, I personally seem to learn more about my losses, and I don't call them failures, but it, they're all learning experiences. Yeah. Share with us a little bit. I want to take a little break from the, the Vanderbilt years, but share with us a little bit of what you, from what you've just described. Has that translated into your adult life, or maybe have you been able to share some of that with your sons? I know that they're they're 14 and almost eight, but they play team sports. They've got those goals in mind. They know their dad played big time college and a little bit of professional sports. But has that translated later on for you guys? Well, absolutely. I mean, I've had my own personal situations where sticking in there and hanging in there and not giving up was the thing that I had to do to to be able to be able to have success. And so, and that all went back to the things I learned going through those, those, um, those tough moments with, with football. And so absolutely, I have conversations with my sons all the time about things that I've been through and things that are going to be necessary in order to have success. And, you know, I, I even, I even bring up conversations that are sometimes or maybe a little, not the most comfortable conversation, you know, where I didn't look good in it. Mm -hmm. But I got to tell this story to my son so that he learns from it, you know, and absolutely football is, and, I, and this is where I say football is different from the other sports that I've played anyway, is that football is, it's a tough grind, not always fun, but I got more out of that sport than any other sport in that I, I pull so much of I pull so much from that experience into my life, even to this day. Mm -hmm. And it all, it all goes back to this sport. And that's why I, mean, I love this sport. And, you know, I, my one son who's crazy about it, you know, I want him to understand 
that, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things you're going to get from it, but there's a lot of stuff you're going to get from it that you don't even realize yet. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, yeah, yeah, we definitely have those conversations. And speaking of, speaking of a guy who knows all about dad talk, I want to welcome T Banks is in the house with us tonight. Let's see. Oh, Billy Smith, one of the Keystone Cops. Bob Capabianco. Thank you, Bob, for showing up tonight. Uh, We got uh, Edie Kelsey is with you. You got a big house tonight. Gerald, we got all kind of folks want to say hello and share some love with you. Good to to see everybody out there. And to, I mean, this is a great, great thing you're doing here. Who Who knows where this show may go? Man, I used to it was some years ago. I used to see the Tennessee Balls. They had a, they had kind of a show they would do where they would bring back players, and it was kind of a live, in-person kind of thing they were doing. And I remember thinking, man, that's great that they bring those guys back and had like these little roundtable kind of discussions, you know. And that was great. But yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. No, oh, I, I appreciate you and all the others who keep showing up each week because these conversations, I learned so much each week and 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 I really appreciate you sharing your story and guys I've got Gerald Collins one of the the finest athletes that I ever played with and I want to talk about how Watson Brown convinced you and some others to put on a dunk contest exhibition during the halftime of a Vanderbilt basketball game you got to go there what year is this how did this come about yeah it actually it was just kind of a we were just kind of messing around one day before uh, like maybe before winter conditioning or something. And they had that little gym over in McGugan. And usually there wouldn't be a basketball around for us to mess around with. Mm -hmm. But that day, you know, there was a, there was some balls in there. So of course we get in there and we start doing all this. It was, it was maybe four or five of us who could get up there and dunk and do this different stuff, man. And, uh, I guess at some point, some of the coaches came in there and started watching because a crowd kind of gathered around, you know, myself and Tony Jackson. I remember Marcus Wilson, some of us, we were all just out there and uh, it kind of, it kind of became a little, little competition. So anyway, um, and we kind of went on to practice or whatever and didn't think any more of it. And then it was a little while later, coach Brown told us that, you know, he was, he was, uh, he had made arrangements that we could go in at halftime. It was, it was a Vanderbilt versus Florida basketball game, probably in the spring of 90, maybe. Mm-hmm. And, um, but anyway, he said at halftime, Hey, y'all get to go out there and just show the, show the basketball crowd, what you guys can do. And it, it was cool, man. It was, it was really cool. That's a lot. That's so fun. So I guess your knee had healed enough by, you know, it's been yeah, four or yeah, five yeah. months later. Yeah, I was I was back, you know, kind of doing my thing. Was going through winter conditioning, and didn't didn't lose a whole lot, you know, from that from that experience, you know, from a from an athletic standpoint. That that yeah, I kind of got over that and was, you know, I actually had during the season came back to practice, and you know, I was I wasn't out I wasn't out that long. I can't remember how long I was out of practice, but it wasn't really long. But I was kind of wearing a knee brace there for a while, I think, and. Um, but then I was, you know, toward the end of the season, I was kind of back to my old self. We were just running the scout team. Uh, I remember myself and old DJ Bradley out there uh, on that scout team. There's other guys too, but I remember DJ was always right there with me. Well, speaking of a guy who I think was also in your recruiting class, he says, if I, if I tell you, I want you to tell me who this is. He says 40th Street. Who's that? 40th Street. Oh man, in my class, well, it's a lot of people that would have maybe uh maybe Tony Jackson or you say in my in my close, he played quarterback. Played quarterback. Joe in my class? Joe P. Oh, Joe. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Joe, yeah. thanks for yeah, it's thanks funny. Joe, this. Joe used to have a radio show mm-hmm. that he did. I guess broadcast from from Vanderbilt, and I used to always tell him to, "Hey man, give a shout out to 40th Street." Nice. <laughs> and nice. I think for a long time he just kept always giving that 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 that, that shout out. That's so great, That's guys. Oh, we got some good memories. I want to talk about some game memories for you about disrupting and and just letting homecoming at Georgia just go by. So poorly for them. Let's go to that game if you remember. Yeah. 
that was uh that was my last year there and um we went down to Georgia and Georgia you know they were they were pretty good I don't I don't know that they were in one of their better years but you know Georgia's Georgia and they had some athletes they had a quarterback who I think was one of the best quarterbacks I played against was Eric Zire and I was man I was really impressed with that guy yeah. he was really good and um but anyway man that day our offense Ronnie Gordon and Royce Love and Jermaine Johnson, man, those guys, they put on a show and, you know, we hung tough on defense and we ended up beating them down there on their homecoming. That was a, that was a big, big, big win. And, um, you know, just a lot of things clicked that day. And I remember I was, I, I remember I saw Terrell Davis cause you know, I, I, I had heard his name, but I didn't really know who he was. or yeah. definitely didn't know what he was going to become. Mm -hmm. and anyway, we were in, it was, I'm pretty sure it was the senior bowl. Because mm -hmm. um, I went to the blue gray in the senior, but I'm pretty sure it was a senior. But anyway, he was, we were riding the bus to practice one day. And he kind of just looked at me and he said, man, y'all ruined our season. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, hey, man. It is what it is, but that's man, right. He 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 had this look on his face, like like really sad, like that. Just it ruined their season. I was I was glad we could we could uh we could do that because yeah, that was a big 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 win. Well, that's you know there was a, a several years that we just had Georgia's number, and yeah. most recently Zach Cunningham, I think it was in sixteen or seventeen, yeah. he had such a phenomenal game and. A big stop, and I, I remember that. Did he yeah. tackle Chubb? I can't remember which of those running backs he stopped from fourth down. But from time to time, we seemed to sneak up on Georgia. Uh, yeah, we had another big win. Was it uh, maybe 90, 91 maybe where we we beat them, and that was a uh, um, it was a home game where we beat Georgia. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it was ninety one. Might have been ninety one, but like Sam Chalmers yeah. and. Corey Harris and those guys were just yeah, and then and then we beat them um, six or seven years ago at home as as well. But uh, yeah. but let's take it off the field for a few minutes, Gerald. What what if anything did you like about the academics side of of being at Vanderbilt? Well, I can tell you what I. And, I, and I'm candid about this with my kids. I went through some struggles with academics and a lot of it was just when I, when I first came into Vanderbilt, I didn't necessarily understand the level of commitment that you had to have towards your academics or, or at least you know, I didn't understand how to be organized and how to, you know, just make study time and just, you know, and, and, and to be honest with you, I wasn't putting into it what I should have. Mm -hmm. And I had a, and I had a wake up call and man, I, I tell my kids, I've told them my wife, they all know the story, but I, um, I got to a point where I was about to be not at Vanderbilt anymore. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I got, um, I had an opportunity to appeal and I put together a plan of what I was going to do to straighten things out because I, I understood that it was, you know, I wasn't putting in what I should have and I, I knew I could fix it and I was able to get in, into this um, appeal and kind of explain that and express that and they, by the grace of God, I was allowed to remain in school and that was my wake up call and I turned things around and you know, it was, it was, it, it was challenging. It, it, it always was challenging, but I made it a lot easier on myself when I made time to take care of the things I needed to take care of, because I, I, there wasn't, there wasn't anywhere to, I couldn't go back. Like I, I mean, I was, I was, I was not planning on going back home and it worked out that I didn't have to, because yeah, that would have been the worst thing in the world. But I, I, I use my story as a cautionary tale for my kids. Like, look, you got to take care of business. And my son, you know, right now he's at Innsworth. And so he's going through a, about a Vanderbilt level academic thing right now in high school. He's getting a taste of it right now. And so, um, 
you know, I'm having those conversations with him and he's, 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 he's doing a good job and he's, but he had, he had some rough times when he started out just, you know, going from, it's just a different expectation from what he was used to. And that's kind of what I went through when I went to, to uh, Vanderbilt, but I had, you know, I, 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 I got my wake up call and I was able to turn it around. So, um, I'm and thankful. You know, you know, it's it's those life experiences right there that define a lot of what later in life you're able to accomplish. And the fact that you not only remember vividly what happened off the field I'm talking about, but you're then able to take those lessons and share them with your sons. And, and they may or may not make the same decisions They'll have to sink or swim on their own, but at least they have you to guide them through that process. And I think that's just such a beautiful thing about being a parent. It really is. Um, but Gerald, you get through the 93 season, you get through the 94 season. And at what point during that process, if, if at all, are you being advised or are you thinking, hey, I want to give professional ball a shot. I, I, I want to see if I can cut it on the next level. When did that start part of your thought process? Well, that was, that was always a goal, you know, playing on the next level was always a goal. Mm -hmm. Probably like, like, like most people, but I, you know, I started getting serious about it. So, so 93 was the season when most of my classmates who I came in with, mm -hmm. that was our last season together. The the Tony Jacksons, the Allen Youngs, and John DeWitts, guys like that. Um, and then I had the opportunity because of that medical red shirt, I had an opportunity to come back in 94. And so 93, I had been thinking about, you know, hey, should I come back? Should I? Um, but I'm gonna tell you, I was excited about the young talent that we had, because I looked at it. And I was really, really, really excited about the James Manleys and the Jamie Duncans mm -hmm. and all these young guys, Eric Vance. And I mean, we had some talent coming back. They were young and Carlton <laughs> Hall. I mean, all, all these guys were just. Now, Gerald, by now, this is your sixth yeah. year, a, a yes, rare sir. sixth year. And were they still calling you business or were they calling you grandpa at this point? Most of them were calling me the old man. <laughs> rock rock batting to this day still called me he, he gave me the old man oh that's so great. yeah i was i was the old man around there and i was uh, you know i tell you what i i was uh very just aware of the fact that i had to set a good example because mm -hmm. at that point you know i'd been around a while and man and i was and i had some goals that i wanted to hit for that last year and i was I had some expectations of my teammates mm -hmm. and I wanted to make sure I was doing and leading and doing all the things. And when it came to conditioning and all of it, I was going to make sure I was leading. And I, I'm just envisioning you holding court in the locker room. Yes, young fellas, come sit around. Let's talk about uh, what we need to talk about today. <laughs> yeah, we had some. We had uh, we had to have a few players only meetings. I remember that, <laughs> and I won't get into the the content of some of it. But yeah, it, it it got you know it was it was times where we had to bring everybody together to see if we could work out some issues, and you know that was just part of it. And I I. When I was a younger guy, I looked at my leaders on those teams and I learned and I understood what I needed to do when I became that guy. That was always a goal of mine was to be a captain. I ended up being a two time team captain, man. And I, you know, I took it serious and I understood that this was an honor and that I needed to make sure that, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm leading in every in, in every way. You know, and, and, and sometimes when we're, we find ourselves in that role, we either hate the role, but we still carry on what we're supposed to, or we relish the fact and appreciate what the responsibility is. And I suspect you're the latter of the two, that you, you realized and appreciate at that time that it was your time to lead. Yeah. 
And, and you can lead by example, by doing. You can lead by talking, which is sometimes that can be good or bad. But just knowing your personality back then, I suspect you had a combination of the two. And, and how receptive were the young guys, the Manleys, Carlton Halls of the, the team, taken to, to what you had to say? I think, I think they were, well, those guys understood about me that number one, I'm not a big talker, number one. But when I, when I, when I had something to say, they understood it was something that needed to be said and that it was kind of like, hey, if this guy's standing up here in front of us, we better be listening. And so they were, they were very receptive and, um, you know, they, I mean, I, I can't say enough about just how I felt, I felt like reinvigorated just being around those guys, man. It was, it was a great, it was great being around those guys because they were young, they were hungry and they had all this talent, man. And, and so I was, I was honored to be one of the guys along with um, Eric Lewis Bill Sullivan, uh, Richard Signs, we were we were the the, the four seniors, mm -hmm. and those guys were great leaders as well. And but but we had a young group that we were responsible for, kind of leading leading the way for. And I um, and I can't I can't say I mean I wish we could have had, I wish we could have reached that goal. But Michael, one of my reasons I came back was to go to a bowl game. I'll be honest with you. That was that was the one thing that I that was always a goal, and to this day, you know that when I think back, that 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 stings me to this day that we did. Yeah. Bill Bill Sullivan has joined us. Marcus Williams has joined us. Gerald, just one. Hey, good to see you guys, Big Sully. Gerald, you you get through your senior year, and you sign undrafted with the Bengals. And I want you, you shared a pretty intimate personal story with me previously. I want you to share what you want to want to share about the life and the, the lessons of, of how NFL works, because you learned it, lived it pretty quickly. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing. I, and I, I, don't, I don't think I mentioned this, but, but like, so on, on draft, on draft night. So I was, I, I was thinking that I was going to get drafted. I was hearing that I was going to be maybe a later round pick. Didn't get drafted, but um, I started getting phone calls toward the toward the end of the draft. You know, these teams basically saying, "Hey, um, if you don't get drafted, we're 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 looking to sign free agents." Mm -hmm. So anyway, I get I get a call from uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and none other than they put none other than John Norwig on the phone, <laughs> Mister John Norwig. Uh -huh. and he was like Gerald. I'm telling you, he's like, Coach Cower wants you. Coach Cower wants you to come to Pittsburgh. He's like, they asked me to give you a call because they knew I knew you. And then I get a call from Bill Cower. He's telling me about a guy. He's like, we got this guy we think you can beat out. And anyway, so I'm, I'm, I, I think at that time I got it down to where it was Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, and another team that I was uh, considering. And I ended up choosing Cincinnati. I was looking at the I was looking at the personnel that linebacker that Pittsburgh had at the time, and I was looking at what um, what Cincinnati had, and, and we just kind of felt like my best opportunity was going to be in in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and I, I try not to you know I try not to think about it much, but I, I you know it's like man, I had a chance to go to this world class organization in Pittsburgh and just didn't didn't, I guess, see it at the time, you know, and, and, you know, I went to Cincinnati and, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to beat them up a whole lot, but, you know, it was, it was just a, it was just a different, wasn't, it wasn't quite what I expected when it came to, you know, some of the things that happened, happened later. And I, and I'll get into that here in a second, but I, but I went in that, that, that first year and, um, you know, was, it's a different, it's a different thing from a mental standpoint, the things you have to know playing the position at that level was, was a lot different. Just the level of detail was so much different. And, and so I was picking that, I was picking that stuff up. I felt like I was picking it up pretty good. The, the physical part of it, you know, I didn't, didn't have a big, big issue with that. 
I tell you where I noticed the biggest difference was the skill positions. I mean, these guys were super quick and super fast, you know, on a different level than you than you have in college. Um, as far as the taking on linemen and line and fullbacks and all that, wasn't a whole lot different. Uh, the, the linemen actually were more finesse than what I was used to in the SEC. The SEC, the linemen would come off the ball and try to take your head off. Um, in that league at that time, it was, man, they would basically bait you in and then they'd hold you, hold you for a second and let you go. And by that time, the ball was, you know, by, it was kind of that thing. And so, but it was a, I mean, it was a good experience. And I remember I was up there with some other guys who were undrafted and, you know, we kind of had a little, little click and we were all just working hard and just trying to encourage each other. And I remember we had a couple of guys from Auburn, Chris Schelling and um, Sam Shade from Alabama. He was a rookie up there. And we were also up there with Kajana Carter. Everybody was just trying to trying to encourage everybody. And I remember on the day we we found out we made the team, you know, it was like it was funny how you're 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 there that day and everybody knows it's the final cut day. <laughs> And you're, you're, you're hoping nobody comes up and taps you on the shoulder, you know? And um, anyway, we, at the end of the day, it was a couple of us and we got outside to get ready to go to our cars. And by that time we said, right, well, I guess we made it. And we all kind of, you know, got a little excited there for a second. And then we went home, and, you know, and uh, so it was, it, it was cool, but it was, you know, people ask me, you know, what, what that was like, but it was, to me, it was just football. It was just the next season of football. It's like I kind of expected to, to make the team. Um, but, but don't you have kinda, to take that? I don't mean to interrupt you, but you said something important right there. Don't you have to have that mentality that, that you expect that whatever you're going to do, you, you can only control you what you can, can do, but you have to go into that with the mindset, I'm going to make this team. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you doubt yourself, you're not going to perform. Yeah, yeah. And that, and that was kind of the way I looked at it was, I mean, I, when I got there, I realized that I did belong, mm -hmm. that there was nothing that, you know, there's nothing out here going on that I can't do. There's some stuff I, I need to learn, especially in the passing game. But I understood that I, that I belong and that I could play at that level. And it was, you know, it was a matter of just keep grinding and, and I can tell you, it's weird, man, but I, I remember, I, I kind of remember when I, when I made the team, when I knew I made the team, this was about a week before, but we had a, um, we had a scrimmage, we had like a, a inter squad scrimmage, and we were doing short yardage and goal line, and, and I just, you know, I got a chance to get in there, and man, I made some plays in the backfield, and and everybody was kind of just all hyped up and excited because of these plays I made. And anyway, the next day, all of a sudden, all these coaches who had never said a word to me, I mean, not one word, every, everybody was speaking to me, like talking to me and speaking to me. And, and I thought it was kind of odd, but it was like, all right, my name is getting discussed in these meetings. And I kind of, and my, and my position coach started kind of communicating with me a little differently but it was it was kind of weird, like it was maybe decided at that time. Who was your who was your position coach? His name, a guy named Joe Pascal. Joe mm -hmm. Pascal. And man, I tell you, and I tell my son, my son's real into like watching film and stuff, man. And I tell him I learned more in that short time that I was with Joe Pascal. I learned more in that short time than I probably learned, especially about pass defense from a linebacker. I learned more in that time than I did the whole time I was at Vanderbilt. And that's, and that wow. is honest. That wow. is absolutely honest. Wow. And Gerald, who was the head coach uh, for Cincinnati? Dave, Dave Shula, mm -hmm. Dave Shula. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that was a, that was a different kind of, kind of story. But anyway, I'm, I know I kind of, kind of dragged on, but we had, um, we got to, and it was against the, the Houston Oilers where I got hurt. I ended up getting hurt on a, 
uh, I was on the kickoff return team and got hurt and kind of tore my leg up pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of what got me put on injured reserve. Was but it the same knee you had hurt at Vanderbilt? Well, it wasn't my knee. It was actually the same leg, but it was, uh, I had a broken bone mm. in my, uh, just below the knee. And then I had a ankle where all the ligaments around my ankle was all torn up. So oh my. it was kind of a double, double whammy, mm -hmm. pretty bad, pretty bad injury. And, um, you know, that was kind of, and I came back that next year and uh, I don't know how much time we got, but I can tell that quick story. But I came back that next season. So I was out that whole rest of that season. That was about the fourth or fifth game. I was out the rest of the season. And then we come back to camp the next season. And the, and the first day of pads of the next season, I broke my hand, broke my right hand. And doing a, a, um, a fumble recovery drill, which is something you wouldn't necessarily think would be going on at that level. But right. You know, I broke my hand and it was kind of a, you know, it was kind of a, I was ready to play with the broken hand. I didn't care. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't, they wouldn't allow me to practice. I could, I could go out there, but I couldn't participate in the, in the um, full contact drills. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, to make a long story short, after not practicing for a long time, we get ready to have a scrimmage one day on a Saturday. And all of a sudden the trainer comes in there and says, Hey, you ready to play today? And I was like, uh, am I, am I allowed? You, you, you guys are going to let me play practice. He's like, yeah, yeah. We're going to be in full pass today. And so anyway, I'm all excited. Of course, I'm all like, man, I'm all jacked up excited because I hadn't practiced in a while anyway. So I go out there and I didn't get in any of the scrimmage, the, Defensive plays, I was just kind of on special teams. Basically, I was on the, the uh, punt team, and I would line up at my spot, and the punt, the punt drills weren't live. We would just punt the ball and just kind of run down the field. And that was about it. Anyway, the very next day, I was cut. Very next day, I was cut. And, you know, it was, <laughs> I was like, wow. But that was uh, and now now tell them why you later learned why they had you running up and down the field. Yeah, well, kind of kind of the way I understood it was that so when you're hurt, when you are declared hurt, like they can't they can't release you while you're hurt. Mm -hmm. And so when they got me on film running down the field, and I mean basically I was in full I'm I'm scrimmaging. And so that says to like, like if I was to try to challenge it or whatever, that says to whoever, well, here he is on field. He's on, on film. He's, he's running down the field. He's, he's scrimmaging. And so basically I was declared healthy and then they went ahead and, and, you know, released me. Yeah, and that's, that's why the league is next man up has always been the mentality. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and, you know, and I, I, I understood that. I mean, I, I don't, I don't necessarily like underhanded kind of stuff. You know, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the type of guy you can shoot me straight and, and I'll accept that. I just don't like the kind of underhand. And, that, and that's why that always left a bad taste in my mouth about Cincinnati. But, you know, I've since, I've since gotten over it, but I'll, you know, I tell that story when, when, when people want to know, people ask me a lot about my experience in there. I wow. say, well, do you, do you really want to know? Cause I can tell you, you know, you know, some organizations do it the right way, and, and but probably most don't. But that's the league. That's the way that it's run. But it, and I appreciate you sharing that, Gerald, because I know that's not the easiest of stories because that's an athlete's recognition, whether they want to or not, that it may be time for their career to pivot, maybe away from sports or maybe away from the league that they had been in. Where did it take you once you got cut? What was the reality now for you going forward? Well, my, my mentality was that I wasn't done, number one. So <clears throat> I wanted to continue playing. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And at the time, they had the uh, NFL Europe going mm-hmm. on. And so some one of those teams over there had gotten my my right, my rights through whatever. I can't remember what they were doing at the time to get certain players right. But a team had my rights and I was making arrangements to go over there to play. And, and I don't know, maybe maybe I really didn't want to go, but I didn't. I didn't get my passport and everything ready in time to make everything happen. I, and I, to be honest with you, I don't really think I wanted to go that bad. Um, so maybe, maybe that kind of got in the way, but I was, I was, you know, I was staying in shape trying to get back into a, back into an NFL camp. And I'll tell this quick story before we have to go, but yeah. I, so I was working out like crazy for, you know, the next year and my agent was checking in, trying to find out. Mm-hmm. And we didn't hear from anybody for like all of that season. And then I want to say all of the next season, we didn't hear from anybody. And then when I came back to Nashville and was started interviewing for jobs and doing all this, all of a sudden I get a call from my agent and he says, he said, Gerald, tell me, tell me you've been working out still and that you're in shape. And I was like, what do you mean? Why? I was like, man, we hadn't heard from anybody in a long time. And he's like, well, I got the, he's like the Jacksonville Jaguars called and they want you to come to camp. They had an injury and they want you to come to camp and they want you in pads in a couple of days ready to play. And by that time, man, I, I literally had stopped working out. I was on the interview circuit and was really into trying to, you know, get my, I, I figured my, my, my time was over. And anyway, so I told the guys like, man, I hadn't worked out in several months. And I was like, he's like, well, man, can you at least talk to the guy and, and kind of see what you can work out and see if maybe they'll bring you in and let you work your way in shape. And so the guy from Jacksonville called and he said to me that, Basically, they they needed somebody to step right into camp and to get on the field like right away. And I said, man, I know how my body needs to feel to play football. And I was like, I'm not I'm not going to waste your time and mine by coming there and end up, you know, getting getting injured or something. So, you know, I said I told my mind to decline this this one. And I mean, I truly if I felt like I could have played, I would have gone because, you know, but at that point, man, my. Mentally, I had already uh, closed that closed that page. You know, some, and Gerald, some athletes will never let it go. And they would have gone to Jacksonville. They would have tried out. They may or may not have made the team for a little while. But it yeah. seems like you had recognized when your time was ready for the next chapter in your, your life. Yeah. And, and it takes a real maturity to do that at 24, 25, however old you were at the time and as gary just said i'm sure that was one of the more difficult decisions of your young life at that time but looking back i bet you don't regret it either i bet you made no, the right I don't, decision. i don't regret it because an, another thing that i realized and i and i, I didn't want to accept it at that time mm-hmm. but my body was breaking down mm-hmm. as far as my back i got some things with my back that mm-hmm. were going on then and actually, the day the day that I got cut from Cincinnati, I walked out of that building with my back all just where I couldn't even stand up straight. Mm-hmm. And it just was one of these things that that and this had happened going back to when I was in high school, this issue with my back. Mm-hmm. And it would just kind of flare up and then it would go away, flare up and go away. And I went through it in college. I didn't squat my whole senior year in college because of my back. Mm-hmm. But anyway, my my body was breaking down and I didn't I didn't I didn't want to accept it. And when it when it felt right, it felt great. So I, you know, thought, hey, no, nah, I'm fine. And yeah. so but in but in hindsight, that was, you know, that was that was the end of the road for me with, uh, you know, with football. And you, you probably because of that bell buckle experienced, you learned how to push through. But but had you not had the maturity at the time. I think you might have done even more harm to your body had you thrown yourself back into to the fray. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember I told that story, that same story I just told. I told that story to Durego Lewis. He, he was a teammate from back then. Mm -hmm. And this was years ago. I remember telling him that story. And I remember him saying something to the effect of, yeah, who knows? Just say you had tried to come back and who knows what might happen, man. You might yeah. end up all messed up. And, you know, sometimes you, know, you got to listen to your body. Your story is Joel Walker, former teammate of both of ours, just pointed out. Thank you. It's a cautionary tale for guys coming out of college who think they want to make it into the league or play professionally. You got to listen to your body. You got to recognize what your body can do and what it takes to be at your peak performance. And it doesn't take the folks in the league very long to recognize you can't fake it until you make it in that, in the league. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And my, I guess my point being here is, and there's, there's so many lessons you shared with us, Gerald, that I'm sure on some levels you've either shared or you're sharing with your sons now, but I want to thank you for, for getting, getting deep with us and, and sharing your, your story because not a lot of folks want to go there because it's not one of their, their favorite moments of their, their sports career, but you've shared some awesome moments of your sports career, good and bad. So I want to thank you for, for taking us there. And as several folks have pointed out with your quiet leadership at your time at Vanderbilt, they have never heard you talk this much ever combined. <laughs> and they, yeah. they you, know, yeah, you know, guys that know me really close, they know I, I, I cut loose a little bit, but when I'm, when I was in the building over there, I mean, yeah. I, I tended to try to be about business and try to be about the right things. Um, I do want to take a moment to just acknowledge and thank all of my teammates from all those years. I enjoyed every minute. I want to thank all the staff from the trainers, the equipment staff, the people that worked up in the office areas, administrative tickets, whatever. Thank you. And I can tell you that this young man from St. Louis appreciated every minute and every opportunity that going to that place afforded me. And I wouldn't change it. I would not change it. Thank you to everyone. I appreciate everybody uh, kind of, you know, getting on here and listening to what I have to say. Well, I, I got news for you, Gerald. When we get off of here, you need to go into those comments because the comments that I'm seeing rolling through here show how much love they have for you, how much they respected you as a teammate, as a leader. And frankly, half of them are still scared of you, but that's just part of your persona. <laughs> Lots of love for you tonight, Gerald. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us tonight. That's why I'm doing these every week. Yeah. It's, it's kind of the, the unofficial oral history of our program that we all all equally love and hate and come back and love again. And, and ultimately we all bleed the black and gold, but, but thank you, Gerald. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the comments. You had a ton of folks who've been in here tonight. You need to, you need to get in there. I'm telling you. Yeah, I'll, I'll go in there. I'll yeah. definitely go in there and take a look, man. I, I mean, I appreciate people taking the time. I know it's, it's late in the evening, but I really appreciate people taking the time. I appreciate you you know, having me on here and, um, you know, a lot of this stuff, I don't talk about it unless somebody asks, you know, um, but, you know, it's stuff, you know, there's, there's, I could have gone on and, I mean, this thing could have gone in a lot of different directions mm -hmm. and, but, but a lot of good memories. I mean, I can't, I can't say enough about, about what going to Vanderbilt did for me mm -hmm. and that whole experience did for me. And, uh, you know, I, I will never, ever, ever, not support the program, never. Well, that, that's wonderful for you to say, and I know you got a lot out of your experience, but I can assure you the people over at McGugan got as much out from you as you did from them. So again, thank you, my friend. Number 40, Pride of St. Louis, Gerald Collins. See you guys each Tuesday night, Anchor Down. Have a good right. week.